Hey everybody, today I'm going to talk about God's Not Dead, A Light in the Darkness. You know, after I finished talking about the second film, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to say anything substantial about the third. It felt like the franchise had exhausted itself, and I was sort of exhausted with it. But if there's one criticism you can't make of the God's Not Dead series, it's that it's boring or doesn't get new ideas across. This movie is different. Profoundly different from the first two movies, but also different from, like, any propaganda film I've ever seen. So, uh, that's what this video is gonna be about, and I hope you have a good time watching it. With that out of the way, part one. Why this is the same movie we've seen twice already, but with some cosmetic changes that don't really amount to much. So, before we can understand what separates this film from its predecessors, we first have to recognize that in a lot of ways, it's not different from them. That it expresses a lot of the same ideas they expressed, but in a new, kinda fancy skin. And so you can see what I mean by that, let's talk about the main plot of this movie. This time around, my all-time favorite, Pastor Dave, is the protagonist. The movie starts with a heartbroken atheist boy unintentionally setting fire to Dave's church, and killing Dave's best friend, Jude. Although the church is privately owned by Dave, it's surrounded by a state university, one that's become increasingly hostile towards Christians. The administration takes this church-burning, friend-dying situation as a great opportunity to get rid of the church once and for all. If we kick the church off campus now after what just happened, how do you think that's going to look? We're going to look bad, no matter what we do. But in the long run, this is what's best for the students. Rather than rebuilding it, something that would have been fully covered by insurance, the school decides to eminent domain it, that is, coercively buy the church from Dave, demolish it, and put up a student union building. For most of the movie, our hero tries to prevent this from happening with the help of his bro. Okay, looking at this weird, convoluted plot, I want to make a point. Whatever else this movie is about, this, this case, is what it's about. First, in a very literal way, it claims that the government hates the Christian God and wants to stomp on religious liberties through whatever legal means it can. Eminent domain. Second, in a more figurative sense, it claims that society at large is against evangelicals. Dave's church, a representation of all faith and religion, is being bulldozed by a world that seeks to further a small-minded, atheist agenda. And these are, you might notice, the same exact positions held by the first two films. Within the trilogy's logic, there has always been a big bad secular world. There has always been a bunch of good Christian folks fighting against it. Do you hate God? <laughs> And there has always been an over-the-top battle that works to stir up the movie's audience with anti-atheist, anti-government sentiments. In the name of tolerance and diversity, I say we destroy her. Now, if you're a big fan of God's Not Dead, A Light in the Darkness, the idea that this film is just rehashing the ideas of the first two might seem a bit unfair. Big Joel, you're probably saying. You're just straight up missing out on important things in the film that radically deviate from G Not D 1 and 2. You're intentionally misrepresenting the movie, and if you paid attention to various facts about it, you'd see that it's not trying to engender mistrust in the secular world. It's trying to do quite the opposite. But, uh, I don't think you're right about that, oddly zealous fan of this movie. And I think it's worth spending a fair bit of time talking about why I don't think you're right. First off, you might say, how could this movie be hating on atheists when, unlike the first two films, there's a clear attempt here to present atheists in a much more charitable, compassionate light? And there is a lot of truth in that statement. In God's Not Dead 1, there's Jeff the Profeff a man so pushy about his atheism that he tries to force his class to disavow the Lord. In the second, we have the literal devil, a lawyer who fights against religion in the classroom because he hates God. We're going to prove once and for all that God is dead. He hates him. In the third film, though, there is no D-bag. In fact, there's a lot of atheist or agnostic characters who are pretty cool. We have the well-meaning hottie who throws a brick into the church, but who learns from his mistakes. The social media man who thinks God is silly, but who's a nice dude. 
the agnostic girl who's assured by Josh Wheaton, the guy from the first movie, that it's okay to question God's existence. It's good to ask difficult questions. God can use it. He's not afraid of your uncertainty. And we have Dave's brother, who doesn't necessarily believe in a Christian God, but who is loyal and cares about religious freedom. But man, you're my little brother. And I don't like to see people push you around. And that's why I'm helping you. And it might be tempting, looking at all that, to say this film is simply not divisive in the way the first two are. Atheists aren't the enemy here. They're allies and people who ought to be loved in a Christian sort of way. But I don't think that position totally captures the meaning of this movie. Because, yes, individual secular actors are no longer malignant within the film's logic. But secularism, as a more general force, is malignant. Trying to destroy someone's church out from under them because their god is too controversial for you is, on the face of it, a morally reprehensible thing to do. To my eyes, it's far worse than a professor shoving his beliefs down his students' throats, or a lawyer being too litigious about a teacher bringing up Christian stuff. Atheism is plain out evil in this movie, and what's more, it's evil in a really disconcerting way. See, when you watch the first two films, there's a certain comfort you can take in the fact that you know where the bad times are coming from. It's this guy, and this guy. Them and people like them are the problem, and solving the problem means defeating those people. It's that simple. But in G03, secularism, posed as an ideology that seeks to oppress Christians, has no origin, and can't be pinned down. This guy, who gets bulldozers to tear down Dave's church, isn't a bad man. He's pushed to do those things by the school board. The school board, which wants religion out of their school, isn't made up of bad people necessarily. They're being animated by something else. The attitude toward Christianity on campus and in America. The destructive atheist force portrayed in this movie is super scary. Something that we want to fight against, but which is ubiquitous and shifty and amoral. So, no. I don't think that having more compassion toward individual atheists makes the film any less anti-atheist. They just sorta kick the bad, secular can down the road. Okay, the second point you might make in defense of this movie is that it doesn't end in the same heavy-handed, pro-evangelical, anti-secular way that the other two films end. Where God's Not Dead 1 and 2 culminate in a total victory for the Christian world, the third breaks that mold. Rather than going to court to defend his right to the church, Dave gives up the claim to his land, allows the university to build its student union building, and advocates a more peaceful, forgiving brand of Christianity. Let this candle represent peace, hope, and unity. And love. And this moment looks like quite the olive branch, right? Something that works to get rid of a divisive, anti-secular mentality rather than embrace it. But again, I don't think that read is totally accurate to what the movie's doing. See, what Dave performs here is a sacrifice. One that is explicitly coded as good and Christ-like. I think that he saw people suffering and he made a sacrifice for them. Surely the parallels to Christianity are not lost on you. And when a character in a movie performs a sacrifice, when they martyr themselves, that presupposes one thing. That society is the sort of place where such a sacrifice is being asked for. When Dave gives up his church, we, as an audience, are supposed to think, yes, destroying people's religious spaces for almost no reason is a thing that people like to do. Freedom of religion in America is fundamentally a sham, and society, by and large, would vote to ban Christianity if they had the chance. The hero's sacrifice here can only be noble because society is terrible, and because any act that could enact change in that society must be great. So, God's Not Dead 3 may look more compassionate than its predecessors, more accepting of secularism, more seeking of compromise, but really, underscoring the film is the same basic stance we've seen twice before. Christians are oppressed by some very powerful people. It's old hat at this point. With that, part two. 
Why God's Not Dead 3 is so weird and subversive that it kinda blows my mind. Okay, let me tell you something that might seem pretty obvious to you. This entire case makes no sense. Even within the context of the God's Not Dead trilogy, it makes no sense. In the first film, looking at Jeff forcing his students to say God's dead, we know that's ludicrous and doesn't happen, but we can recognize what they're talking about. College professors have a high propensity toward atheism, and it's true that any university ethics class you walk into will mostly discuss moral theories that don't involve God. And that's what's being targeted in this story. In the second film, again, we have a very unrealistic conflict. No high school teacher's ever been fired or threatened for talking about the relationship between MLK and Christianity. But still, we know what they're talking about. Public school teachers are not allowed to advocate their faith or teach about creationism, and the movie seems to take some issue with that. But in Genon 3, what are we even talking about? Universities aren't getting rid of churches near their campuses. They need those churches because they have students who like to pray and go to mass. Eminent domain isn't used as an excuse by people who dislike religion to get rid of religious buildings. I mean, there have been a few cases where the government tried to coercively buy church land, and I'm not necessarily defending eminent domain here, but in all those cases, it was because the government wanted to make room for some big structure. Nobody ever thought it was because God is too edgy. Look, the secularizing of academia? I know evangelicals hate that. Not being able to teach religion in schools? I know evangelicals hate that. But this case? Eminent domain? The destruction of churches? That doesn't speak to anything, does it? It's not real, and it doesn't refer back to an actual issue evangelicals have with American law or society. No, the case here can only make meaning in the broadest way possible. Church good, state bad. Besides that, it's arbitrary and unmoored from anyone's lived experience. And looking at all that, we might feel inclined to say something like this. Geez, God's Not Dead has really lost its mind, hasn't it? They've somehow pushed themselves even farther from reality, and it shows. They are pulling at straws. But when I watched the movie, that's not what I was thinking. Rather, I kept having one thought over and over. This case doesn't matter. It doesn't say anything of value, and it doesn't seem to want to do that. Maybe that's the point. Maybe, through its utter purposelessness, the film is suggesting that the entire project of the God's Not Dead trilogy was always a silly one. Maybe the movie is making fun of itself. Making fun of the franchise. Making fun of its status as propaganda. I think this idea might sound a bit ridiculous at first blush. It's a hard pill to swallow, to think this incredibly strident, vapid series just changed its tune in the third film and started criticizing everything it's supposed to represent. But as strange as it sounds, it's a position that's very well evidenced by the movie, and I'm gonna take you through, like, all that evidence. First of all, we have to talk about how this case works, like, in some detail. Because a lot of the time, it seems like the film is actively using the case to mock the sort of gratuitous conflicts we've come to expect from God's Not Dead. So, okay. There's a scene where the school board member trying to get Dave's church taken down, let's call him Schlubel, calls for a bunch of bulldozers to destroy the building. Yeah, what can I say? Signed by the president of the university. Thomas Ellsworth. Unbelievable. Now, this act doesn't just not make sense from a real-world perspective, it also doesn't make sense within the film. The school wants to eminent domain Dave's land. I've said that now countless times, you should know that. But with eminent domain, you have to buy the land before you destroy the stuff on it. Why even bring up this law and talk about what it means if you're just gonna go and pretend like the government can just wreck things that other people own? So, after that, Dave's brother is like, you guys can't do this, I'm gonna go get a judge, don't bulldoze the building in the meantime, or you're gonna get major sued. You touch this church before I get back, I'll have you arrested for destruction of property, okay? And that's rational enough, but then Dave makes a decision that baffles me to this day. He starts filibustering. So the, uh, the Bible 
This is the Word of God. But how often do we really take time to read it? Let's start at the top, shall we? In the beginning. Local pastor David Hill is basically staging his very own version of what can only be described here as a Senate filibuster. Why, Dave? Why are you filibustering? You're not trying to pass or prevent a law here. You're just standing in front of a church. You don't gotta keep talking. Nothing is making you do that. And besides, your brother has already solved the problem. He's handling it. Dave, they're not gonna wreck your church right now. You don't have to filibuster, you absolute madman. <laughs> or let's look at another scene, one where Schlubel gets up on stage and gives reason why the school wants Dave's church gone. That St. James Church has become a beacon of violence and controversy, and it has no place here on Hadley University campus. This moment is interesting because Schlubel's statements here directly contradict any case the school could possibly have. See, the school board wants to get rid of this church. Apparently, it presents something of a PR nightmare for them. But alas, the church is on private property. They can't just take it, and so they have to come up with a pretense. They need the land the church is on to build a student union building. It's not about suppressing religion, it's mostly about the student union building. But here, in this scene, Schlubel utterly destroys that pretense. He says, loud and proud, This is all about a church we want to destroy. There's nothing else to it. The film recognizes, on some level, that that case wouldn't hold up in court, that it obviously violates the First Amendment. Otherwise, they'd never have introduced the student union building in the first place. But here, that logic falls apart. It becomes meaningless. Through these moments that don't make any sense, it seems like the film is suggesting that making sense isn't important. Those bulldozers aren't coming for some big, motivated reason. Dave doesn't have to filibuster, Schlubel doesn't care about the case at hand, and why does the film have to pretend differently? These characters do the things they do because that's what fits the narrative, makes the secular seem monstrous, makes religious people look like law-knowing badasses. The film lays bare the fact that it's not about the real world. It's not even about the film world. It's about a feeling and a rhetoric. And it almost feels like it's looking at the movies that preceded it and saying, you are this way, too. Maybe you're a bit more covert with it and a bit more self-consistent, but let's not fool ourselves. You are, and always were, about a feeling and a rhetoric. So this is all fun, and I think compelling, but it's also pretty abstract. And there are a few places where God's Not Dead 3 more concretely criticizes the unnecessary, artificial nature of the franchise. Like, there are two scenes where characters talk about how badly they were treated by the church. One with the haughty atheist. Do you know why my mom divorced my dad? He used to beat her. You know what our church did? They called her a sinner. They said that if she married again, she'd be an adulterer. They humiliated her. Another with Dave's brother. You didn't take the time to understand what I was going through. I was trying to sort out my own faith, my own sense of God. I was changing, and you all hated me for it. And that's the truth, David. And I can't look at these as anything but a direct challenge to the first movie. In that film, we had Aisha, a Muslim girl whose dad was so intolerant that he threw her out because of her faith. The implication being that evangelicals would never do such a thing. But here, the film suggests that that was all baloney. Aisha wasn't included because the church is a place of universal acceptance. The church isn't accepting, or at least it wasn't. Not of atheists, not of divorcees, and not of gay people, although the film doesn't go there. In these scenes, the film essentially claims that the Aisha section of the first movie was just a jab at a group of people who many Americans like to hate. Muslims. You're beautiful. I wish you didn't have to do that. 
Getting mad at those people is a good way to firm up your base, and that's why they did it. Or look at what must be the most famous scene in the movie, where Dave talks to a black pastor. And no offense, but maybe you'd understand a little better if you were the one being attacked. Brother, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a black preacher in the deep south. I could build you a church with all the bricks been thrown through my windows. What could this be besides a call-out of the entire God's Not Dead ethos? Dave, a representation of Christianity, talks a big game and acts a bit condescending about the hardships he's facing. And the pastor, speaking in some sense for black Americans at large, is like, what are you talking about? The problems you're experiencing do not speak to actual oppressions that Christians endure. They are an oddity, something that can only exist under very specific, very strange circumstances. The pastor's line here positions Dave and the God's Not Dead series as an exercise in oppression tourism. These films contrive fake situations to engender the feeling that evangelicals live under bad conditions. Black people actually live under those conditions. But there's one line in this film that gets at this sense of self-criticism more than any other. After Pastor Dave gives up his church and drops the lawsuit against the university, Mr. Social Media, shocked at what he just saw, says this. Call it a publicity stunt if you want, but we were there. I mean, this dude's legit. He would have won. He could have given Hadley the finger, but he handed it back. He would have won. I got chills when he said that, because on one hand, he's absolutely right. The school had a terrible case from day one. It's obvious they're just trying to suppress religion, and any judge could see that from a mile away. But on the other hand, he's not supposed to be saying that, is he? When you watch God's Not Dead 2, you're seeing another case that should be really easy to win. Grace transparently did nothing wrong. She just accurately answered a question. But the point of that movie is that society is so bad that we can't assume that Grace would win. America is ridiculously punitive. The ACLU is a powerful, God-hating organization. And Grace can only win. Christians can only win if they are willing to fight and are unflinching in their faith. But with this one line, He would have won. The social media guru makes this house of cards come toppling down. The school administration in this film is a straw man. The ACLU in the second film is a straw man. Jeff in the first film is a straw man. But here, the film doesn't hide that fact. Dave would have won. There was never any question of that. The case was designed to look bad and be impossible to lose. Part 3 what do we do with any of this? So, we have two readings of God's Not Dead, A Light in the Darkness, and those two readings do not get along. When you make a movie for an evangelical audience, and you compare your protagonist to Jesus and position him against a world that wants to eradicate his God, I think that he saw people suffering and he made a sacrifice for them. Surely the parallels to Christianity are not lost on you. Then that's what your movie's about. It advocates the same thing that God's Not Dead has always advocated. Christianity is under attack. Likewise, when you make a movie for an evangelical audience and have a Christian character who gets told that he's not systematically oppressed, and that all of this is just a narrative contrivance that doesn't reflect reality, Brother, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a black preacher in the deep south. I could build you a church with all the bricks been thrown through my windows. Then that's what the movie's about, too. It advocates an end to the God's Not Dead persecution complex. My God's not dead, he's surely alive, he's and I don't care at this point to start speculating about which reading is better, more true to the film. I really have no way of figuring such a thing out, and it seems like a question better answered by the film's Christian audience. But I will say this, A Light in the Darkness is the final film in this series. Even if they make another one, I'm certain that this will stand as the climax. It's more intense than its predecessors. More silly, more thoughtful, more gratuitous, more moving, more everything. And after making two films which are so opaque with their messaging, which so clearly want to produce a specific narrative and which will do anything to sell that narrative, 
Maybe it's for the best that the series should end like this. Not with a moment of certainty, but with one of doubt. So, that's all I had to say about God's Not Dead. Can you believe that they chose to put this weird remix of God's Not Dead at the end of the movie? It's so intense and kind of earnest, I don't really know what to do with it. Anyway, uh, now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Brian Fillion asks, Hello Joel, finding hidden depth and value in genres that aren't really known for being high art is super cool and you do that pretty well. Thank you, Brian. But is there a kind of media that you just can't get into? The answer is procedural crime dramas. Uh, there's nothing that can make me disengage from a show faster than if somebody's murdered at the beginning of every episode, and the rest of the time is just being like, Who did the murder? I don't even know. I don't know what it is. I don't want to start, you know, janking procedural crime dramas. I'm sure there's a lot of worthy material there, but it is not my genre. Uh, anyway, if you liked my video, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, and give me money on Patreon, and, you know, follow me on Twitter and all that stuff. I'll see you next time.